Good evening. Welcome to our service for Good Friday. While it wasn't evident to those who stood beneath the cross on that Friday, while we call it good, it is clear to us today. In the death of Christ, there is evidence of the undying love of God. Christ was forsaken for love's sake. Such love is for our benefit, calling us to draw near to the throne of God's grace. This sacrificial love was unrelenting, irresistible, never-ending, and undying. We will not be forsaken. God enters humanity and dies. God's undying love in Christ is both universal and specific. It's for humanity, but also for each and every one of you individually. In our quest for love tonight, we see what love really looks like. And while we want to look forward to Sunday, we must sit with what happens tonight, knowing that Christ was betrayed, Christ was denied, and Christ was crucified. And in doing so, we executed love on the cross. Tonight, we will light our Christ candle, knowing his final breath is only moments away. For those of you worshiping online with us tonight, I invite you to light your own candle too, recognizing that God's presence is in your space at home or wherever you might be. Let us prepare as we bring the light of Jesus into our sanctuary. pray with me. O God of infinite love and power, we gather together on this Good Friday to reflect on the passion of Christ. We are utterly humbled in the presence of such love and mercy. Open our hearts this day to the goodness of Good Friday and fill us with your love and the powerful spirits of holiness. Remove from us all sin, O God. Offer us anew this life in Christ that makes all things new. We pray this in the name of our sacrificed Lord. Amen. Eyes open, shocked awake, much to Please join me in our call to worship this evening. Sisters and brothers, why are we here tonight? To tell what Jesus did in the midst of our brokenness. Sisters and brothers, why are we here tonight? 
Give her praise in the midst of our pain. Sisters and brothers, why are we here tonight? Seek the Lord and to give God our praise. Sisters and brothers, why are we here tonight? Join with the families of the earth as we worship the Holy One. Tonight, as we gather, we remember Christ's actions are ones full of love. Christ's life was love birthed into existence. John reminds us at the beginning of his gospel these words that are so familiar to us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. In our service this evening, we will look at each of the four Gospels, and we will hear the final words that Christ spoke before he ultimately breathed his last breath. After each short text, I will offer a reflection. Uh, Most of it is quoted or paraphrased from a guy, his name is Reverend Dr. Mark Roberts, so these words are not my words, but his. But as we set up our scene tonight, we begin where we ended yesterday, if you were present for our Monday Thursday service. And Jesus has left the table. He took his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane so that he could pray there. And what happened next, as I said last night, was a fear of flurry of soldiers' arrest interrogations and the disciples in distress as they struggled to know what to do. They were threatened and felt unsafe. They did all the things that we do sometimes when fear gets a hold of us. And then the crowds, who themselves were under political oppression, began to get caught up in that very same frenzy. And Jesus' fate was sealed. Crucifixion, the Romans' most hideous way to execute prisoners, was the sentence. And so they took him to Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, and they hung him on a cross next to two criminals. There was mocking and ridicule by the authorities who believed a true king would have never been left to die. But in the midst of all of this, Jesus' last acts and words were simply about love. The first word that Jesus spoke was this, from Luke chapter 23, verses 32 through 34. Two others, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus. There were two criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. It makes sense that the first word of Jesus from the cross is a word of forgiveness. That's the point of the cross, after all. Jesus is dying so that we might be forgiven for our sins, so that we might be reconciled to God for all eternity. This is the good news. That Christ chooses to wipe away our sins, not because of what we have done or because what excuse we have, but because of God's amazing grace, because of his love for us. As we continue in our story, that's not the only thing Jesus says to those who are around him. One of the criminals as we read in Luke 23, verse 39 through 43. It says, One of the criminals who were there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. 
today you will be with me in paradise. Here we encounter one of the most astounding and encouraging verses in all of Scripture. Jesus promised that the criminal would be with him in paradise. Luke gives us no reason to believe that this man is a follower of Jesus or even a believer in any well-developed sort of sense. Maybe he felt sorry for his sins, but he didn't repent. Rather, his cry, remembered, seems more like a desperate, long gasp effort. We should make every effort to live our lives as disciples of Jesus. But in the end, that relationship comes down to trust. Jesus, remember me. And Jesus, embodying the mercy of God, says to all of us, you will be with me in paradise. We are welcome there not because we have the right theology, not even because we live rightly, but because God is merciful and we have put our trust in Jesus. As we remember what Christ did for us on the cross, we remember the love that was shared on the cross. Let us sing together what wondrous love is this. is spoken by Jesus to his mother. John chapter 19, verses 25 through 27 say this, and this is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. 
When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. And then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from at the, that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. As Jesus was dying, his mother was among those who had remained with him. Most of the male disciples had fled, with the exception of the one whom the fourth gospel calls the disciple whom he loved. We can't be exactly sure who that is, though many interpreters believe that it was John, who's the one writing this gospel. But no matter who the beloved disciple was, it's clear that Jesus was forging a relationship between this disciple and his mother. Can you imagine watching your son hang on a cross to die? But Jesus wanted to make sure in that moment that she was cared for. The love he had for his mother, the one who birthed him into existence, who carried him in her womb, The presence of Mary at the cross adds both to the humanity of Jesus, but it also adds horror to the scene. We are reminded that Jesus was a real human being, a man who had once been a boy and who had once been carried in the womb of his mother. And we are reminded of the love that we share with those who we call family. The fourth word is a painful word one that we don't always understand. In Mark chapter 15, we hear this word in verses 33 through 36. Mark says this, When it was about noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Elohi, Elohi, lima shabachthani, which means my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he's calling for Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. As Jesus was dying on the cross, he echoed the beginning of Psalm 22. I encourage you to read Psalm 22 later this evening. But in the words of the psalmist, Jesus found a way to express the cry from his heart. Why had God abandoned him? Why did his father turn his back on Jesus in the moment of his greatest agony? Something many of us, I'm sure, can relate to when we feel alone or isolated or grieved or lost. We cry out to the heavens and say, God, why have you forsaken me? On this side of heaven, we may never know what Jesus was experiencing in this moment or why he was asking this question. Was it because in the mystery of this suffering, he didn't know why God had abandoned him? Or was his cry not so much a question or just an expression of agony? Or was it both? Either way, this moment shows us how Christ felt isolated and alone but love still remained. One of the most profound songs that we sing on Good Friday is Were You There? Where we put our place, ourselves in the place of those who were standing around the cross, asking, were we there when Jesus was beaten? Were we there when Jesus was hung on a cross? Were you there when Jesus took his final breath? Let us sing now, Were You There?
John 19, verse 28 through 29, says this. After this, when Jesus knew that it was all now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, and so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop, and they held it to his mouth. There's no doubt that Jesus probably experienced extreme thirst while he was being crucified. He would have lost a substantial amount of bodily fluid, both blood and sweat. Thus, the statement, I am thirsty, is on the most obvious level a request for something to drink. And those around him gave him sour wine, which would never have actually quenched his thirst a cheap beverage among lower class people. John notes that Jesus said, I am thirsty, however, not only as a statement of physical reality, but also in order to fulfill the scripture. We too, in this moment, need to be reminded of our own thirst, not just of our thirst for physical water, but of our thirst for living water that only the love of God can provide. As Jesus was nearing his final breath, John goes on after he had taken that sour wine in chapter 19, verse 30. It said, when Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. And then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus had accomplished his mission He had announced and he had inaugurated the kingdom of God. He had revealed love and the grace of God. He had embodied the love and grace of God by dying for the sin of the world. Remember John 3.16 said, Jesus came not to condemn the world, but to what? To save it. This was the mission. That we might be saved, thus opening the door for living under the reign of God. And this is the good news. Because Jesus finished the work of salvation, you and I don't have to add anything to it. In fact, we can't. We can only try each and every day to live as God calls us to. Jesus, in this moment, accomplishes something that we never could. He took our sin upon himself and gave his life in return. Jesus finished the mission for what he had been sent to do. And friends, we are the beneficiaries of this great love. Luke ends the gospel with a different last word than Mark. Right before Jesus gives his final breath in Luke's gospel, this is what we hear in Luke 23, verses 44 through 46. It was about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, Then Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Two of the last seven words of Jesus are quoting the Psalms. Earlier, we read Psalm 22, where he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? To express his anguish. Here, he borrows from Psalm 31, where he says, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. Jesus is showing us that he not only entrusted his future to God the Father, but also implies here that he will be delivered and exonerated. Those standing near the cross probably did not understand what he was saying But living thousands of years later, we know what happens next. No, God would not deliver him from death and crucifixion. But something marvelous is coming. 
I entrust my spirit into your hands points towards the future, towards what's about to happen on Sunday, and reminds us that not even death can separate us from the love of God. Last night, um, if you worshipped with us, I invited those who worshipped to light a candle. All of those candles are around our space this evening. And as we lit those candles, you were invited to reflect on a series of questions. What will you choose? Fear or love? Hatred or love? Fame and fortune or love? Power or love? On Good Friday, over 2,000 years ago, those around the cross did not choose love. Love was extinguished. The candles around the room represent God shining brightly. But for a few days, love leaves the world. Love was put to death on a cross. So tonight, after we sing our closing hymn, I invite you to come forward as you feel led and help us extinguish the candles. For those of you worshiping at home, I invite you to extinguish the candle that you have lit. And after you leave, as you feel led, leave in silence. Let us sing our final hymn, O Sacred Head Now Wounded. I invite you to stand. Lord, Lord.